It's episode 106 of the Keto for Women show. You're listening to the Keto for Women show. This podcast provides the tools you need to create your own expression of a healthy ketogenic lifestyle so you can stop obsessing and start living. I'm your host and nutritionist, Sean Miner. Now let's get on with the show. Before we move on, let me take just a moment to shine the spotlight on another brand I adore that has partnered with the Keto for Women show. Four Sigmatic is the go-to authority in all things magic mushrooms. They believe in the real power of using functional mushrooms, such as lion's mane, chaga, and cordyceps, to enhance people's lives and health, and they've done so through products we're consuming every day, like coffee, tea, elixirs, Coco, all the good stuff. I have to admit, I was skeptical when I first heard of Four Sigmatic and the mushroom coffees, but I tried out their products anyway because I was also very curious, as I'm sure most of you are, as to the power of these little mushrooms. After just one packet of the mushroom coffee with lion's mane, I immediately understood the power of these mushrooms. I had a different kind of energy, focus, and clarity that I had ever had before with traditional coffees. It wasn't from the caffeine either. It wasn't jittery. I wasn't lightheaded or anxious like I usually get with caffeine. It was a sustained, gentle energy that lasted most of the day. Since that time and me finding that source of energy that I've always wanted but could never get with traditional caffeine, it is now the only caffeinated beverage I will drink. You may already know this about me, but I do not tolerate caffeine at all and I stay away from it as much as possible because it does give me that anxious, jittery feeling that I don't do well with. But there are times when I just need a little bit of a boost. Either I didn't sleep well the night before, I have something important coming up that day that I need to be really focused on, and this is when I have my Four Sigmatic. Not to mention, it's also super convenient, coming in a tiny little pouch that you just add hot water to and stir. I add coconut cream to mine too and blend it up, and it is an amazing hot beverage that you can take pretty much anywhere with you. Four Sigmatic has also recently come out with a brand new product that I cannot wait to tell you guys about. I've been trying to keep it under wraps for as long as I could because I wanted to make sure it had all the power that I was hoping it would. And now I can talk about it because it's true. They are taking on the beauty and skincare market with their new superfood serum and face mask. That's right. You're now going to put these healing mushrooms on your face. And I have to say they work so well. You all probably also know that I take my natural skincare very seriously, and it does not get more natural than actually being able to eat your skincare, which is exactly what they're doing with this new product line. They recommend ingesting this serum and these masks along with putting them on your skin as the protocol for maximum effect. How cool is that? And I have to say, I've been using these products for a few months now, and my skin has never looked better. It's clearer, it's firmer, there's less fine lines. I don't know how these mushrooms do it, but they really, truly are magical. It also smells really good, it feels really good on, and it absorbs well and quickly. It is awesome under makeup too. It is definitely my new go-to daytime moisturizer. And that says a lot coming from someone like me who really, really cares about what they're putting on their skin. And I also live in a really, really dry climate, which it's hard to find things that actually work here in Colorado. And this stuff is it. Whether you're into coffee, tea, elixirs, or beauty products now, Four Sigmatic has you covered. As a Keto for Women listener, you can stock up on all of these healing magic mushroom products for 15% off. Head to foursigmatic.com slash Sean and use coupon code Sean to get this deal. That's 15% off using code Sean, S-H-A-W-N, at foursigmatic.com dot com slash Sean. You guys are going to love this stuff. 
Hey, hey, friends, welcome back. Thanks as always for joining me on this episode of Keto for Women. Today, we're talking about fitness, answering all of your questions related to healthy movement beyond keto. So we've gotten the keto thing down. We're getting all of our nutrients in. Now, what else do we need to do specifically by way of movement? And I know you all know I'm very much into the movement scene, getting some good exercise, some good fitness in. I mean, it's just so important. So no matter how much you guys don't want me talking about this or are sick of me talking about this, we're going to keep talking about it because I believe in the power of movement and I know firsthand how many of you aren't doing it. So hopefully this episode will give you some tips and tricks. We'll maybe get you motivated to start some movement, try some new movement, do some different stuff and get your fitness level up because we're going beyond keto in this episode. Kristen, how you doing? Hey, I'm back. She's back. Also excited to talk about fitness because it's a very important part of your life as well. It is. It's my jam. So we're going to get to all of your questions in just a moment. Some quick updates, really the only thing, well, two things both of them happening on the same day, which is June 28th. That is next Friday, if you are listening to this remotely close to when it airs. Next Friday, June 28th at 1 p.m. Mountain Time, I'm hosting a live workshop. That is so cool. It's very similar to a podcast, except you can see my face and it's live. So not at all. Oh, you actually have to brush your hair. I have to take a shower and everything. It's a big deal. Maybe dab a little makeup on. Maybe if they're lucky. (laughs) Nobody wants to see these bags under my eyes. (laughs) Yeah. So I love, love, love teaching live classes so much. Just the energy, the vibe, just being able to really feel like I'm conversing with you all instead of sitting in front of a mic and not being able to know what you all are thinking. So we're doing that next Friday, June 28th. Oh, I should probably tell you what it's about. We're talking about keto not working. So if you have had trouble trying keto, it didn't work for you, or you're still doing keto and don't feel like it's really going well or as well as you'd hoped. Basically, what I did to create this workshop is I thought back to when I started keto, which is almost three years ago now, and I was doing my research. And you guys all know this because this is why I have the Keto for Women show. There was nothing about keto for women specifically. And so all the women out there who were trying keto were not having good results. They were having some serious things happen, just not feeling good, not getting the benefits, not getting the weight loss, not getting the mental clarity, all of these things because they were following what essentially a man told them what to do. So that's, of course, why I started this podcast. But then I basically just for this workshop combined all of those things into one place. So we can talk about why it's not working for you. And then of course, what to do about it so that maybe you can have the success that you were hoping you would get from keto because it is possible for many of you. It's just, you've got to tweak some things and change some things up and then see how it goes. So that's what we're doing. So how does that work for a participant? Like, can they ask questions during the workshop or? Great question. So yes, you will have both the ability to submit questions beforehand and then also ask questions during the thing. They will all be kind of like typed into a chat box type situation. So you won't actually be chatting with me. It just makes things very confusing and hard to do technologically (laughs) to make that happen. It's not quite as streamlined of a process. So you will type it in, you'll be able to ask me questions, anything that comes up while we're kind of going over the information, and then you'll have your answer. And so really, that's just for the live participants. Of course, if you can't attend live, you won't necessarily get your question answered. But more than likely, someone else had a similar question, and you will get a recording only if you register. So you have to register for the workshop Even if you can't attend live and you know you can't attend live, as long as you're registered, you will get a replay so you can watch that at your leisure. So very important to note whether you can attend or not, make sure to get registered or you won't see any of it. And that would be sad. So then on that same day, 
is also the start of Fat Burning Female Project enrollment for the July class. Now, if you've been following along for quite a while, you will know that I only have ever done one day enrollment. So it starts and ends on the same day. It has always filled up within that day. But we have been able to make room for more participants in the class, which means I can have more people come in before it's sold out, which means I can do a longer enrollment period. So that is coming up. It will be a full week because we start July 5th which is the following Friday. So you have a full week to enroll. But of course, you might as well make sure you get your seat. And if you know you want to be part of the Fat Burning Female Project in July, June 28th is your day. If you are on the notification list, I will email you to remind you the second it opens, which is pretty cool. So you can be sure to get a spot. Lots of things happening in one day. It's an exciting day, the 28th. Did everyone get that? Friday, the 28th. (laughs) Let's just say it one more time. All right. Should we get to these questions? Let's talk fitness and healthy movement. Actually, before we get started on the questions... Just kidding. Well, yeah. I mean, this is still... (laughs) (laughs) I mean, this is related to fitness and healthy movement, but I do think it would be appropriate for me to give a little background on my history with fitness, Mm -hmm. mainly in the professional realm, just so people know that I'm not just like spewing this information with no background in this whatsoever. I haven't always been a nutritionist. Yes. Before those days, I was a personal trainer, which again, I know many of you already know that, but I spent 11 years in the fitness industry. I spent three years having my own business as a personal trainer. And in that time, it just so happened that I focused on senior fitness, which I don't like calling it that. I don't really know what else to call it, but I specialize in helping people with their fitness levels that were like 50 and over. I just fell into it. It worked for me. I loved it. It worked for them. They loved it. So that has kind of became my specialty in that regard. And then of course, also other general fitness people as well. So I do have background in that too. So I just want you all to know that that's kind of where this passion comes from, not only in everyone having a level of fitness and an amount of movement every day that is healthy for them, but also because I saw with my own eyes what happens to bodies when they don't get that movement and then they start working out for the first time when they're 50, 60, 70 years old. And it is really hard to see and it's really hard for that person. And it's really hard to dig yourself out of. So I just have this like immense passion for people moving their bodies for so many different reasons and that being the main one. We'll talk about it more today, but I just wanted to share that. Well, on the flip side, you probably then saw what fitness and movement can do to recover folks from sort of, I don't know. Absolutely. Yeah. Recovery. But then also if you remain consistent with it over your lifetime, how much differently you move and act and perform and feel like everything is so different when you have had fitness be a big part of your life for so long. It just is like, there are two people that are both 70 years old, look completely different, act completely different, move completely different based on their history with workouts. Yeah. It's a game changer for overall quality of life, I would say. Yeah, for sure. And then the only other thing, and this might be something that you could share your story with too, is my past with fitness. I've always been really active. I've always been really passionate about it. A lot of you know, I competed in a figure competition, took it to a whole new level, competed in a powerlifting meet, again, took it to a whole nother level. I just love fitness, but I also got really sick. And part of that illness was that I didn't have the capacity to work out how I was used to. I was also dealing with significant adrenal burnout and couldn't work out to the point that I wanted to. So I also have this personal experience with needing to dial back my workouts and not being able to work out how I wanted to that I can contribute as well because I've been in a lot of your shoes, both those people that want to work out and can't or don't know how or don't know how much to push themselves or not push themselves. So I've got it all. And I know, Kristen, you also have a little bit of a history with the same thing with 
being super into working out and then having to kind of change how that looked because of your health. Yeah. Let's just say adapt. Maybe. Yes. Big yeah. adaptation phase there. Yeah, for sure. As I was pondering this topic the other day, I really like how you say fitness and healthy movement because they are different and mm -hmm. distinct, but they're equally important. Yes. So. Yes. You can't really do one or the other. You kind of have to do both in order to have yeah. this really balanced approach. So why don't we get into actual questions? All righty. Well, let's start with Grace here. How to strength train without overstressing your body. She's looking for tips. Yeah. So I think this was a big one on a lot of people's minds and is now because we realized through listening to the Keto for Women show, doing your own research, finding out what your body is doing, that a lot of us have a pretty overstressed out body. And a lot of that for some people is how they've worked out. Overtraining is a huge reason for why people have adrenal burnout, especially women. So it depends on where Grace is coming from, but regardless, we'll kind of go over both. The first thing is she mentioned specifically strength training. And the cool thing is strength training is my favorite way to move, but is also one of the best workouts to do to not overstress your body. There is very minimal stress that happens when you strength train smartly. Of course, that has its own kind of caveats there. But if you are already in a state of adrenal burnout, then you can still strength train, you can still maintain and even gain strength while also healing your adrenals. The thing that I think needs to happen the most is that you really, of course, I'm going to say this a thousand times today, need to listen to your body, but you also probably need to dial it back a little further than maybe even you would think. So in general, I would say you wouldn't ever get over like 70, 75% of your maximum effort. So on a scale of like one to 10, where one is you're basically just getting out of bed and 10 is like you cannot breathe. You have to lay down. Your muscles feel like they couldn't lift five pounds. Like you've just completely taxed out your body. You wouldn't want to get any further than say a seven on that scale for you. And that would be obviously still leaving a lot of energy left in the tank. That ensures that you are not getting to that point where your body is now releasing a ton of cortisol, getting your adrenals involved in order to recuperate from that workout. And if you are the kind of person who doesn't think you're totally stressed out right now, but you don't want to go there, you can do so while still pushing yourself as long as you listen to your body and adjust, if you have times where you're more stressed or you're more tired, you didn't sleep well the night before, you didn't eat enough, you just don't feel good, as long as you are in tune enough with your body to know when to take it easy, then use those times where you feel good, which is hopefully quite a bit since you're kind of in this place where you don't have a ton of adrenal stress right now, hopefully you're super healthy and balanced. Use those times to push yourself. Don't be afraid of pushing yourself. Again, as long as you're super in touch with your body, then you won't have that problem. Now, the biggest thing that I think I see most often with people who are strength training and stressing out their bodies at the same time, it's because they're not recovering enough. They're not spending enough time in recovery mode. The most stressful thing about strength training is not taking that time to let your muscles relax, recuperate, recover, build stronger. So you have to take time off in between your strength training sessions, at least a day, maybe longer, depending on how your workouts are, how you feel, how you're recovering. That is super important too. Well, and rest between sets too, right? Yes, that's something that I have learned the hard way, right? You're not good at that. No, I stink <laughs> at it. But it's so important to not just sleep. do your reps and then take like a 30 second break and then get back at it right away. You know, mm -hmm. the rest in between sets is key too. rest until you feel ready again. And that's a really hard spot for people to find because on some days or in some parts of your life, it's like you only need 30 seconds. And you're like, man, I could go do that again. 
Although I would argue that if you can do that, you're not lifting heavy enough, but that's another subject. But there might be days or weeks or months out of your life where things aren't going as well and you need like five minutes, seven minutes in between sets. And that's fine as long as you can see that and take that and roll with it. Yeah. Well, I think something you mentioned earlier about, you know, sleep coming into the equation, you know, what you've ate, how stressed are you at your job, those outside factors. I think that's something that you've really helped me to understand better over the last couple of years, like all that plays into it. So even if I have something scheduled out where, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm supposed to do whatever type of workout. And I used to just push through it no matter what. And now I really do try to adapt my workout to how I'm feeling and how these other stressors in my life are contributing overall, Mm -hmm. right? Because we have just one big stress bucket. So if I slept like crap the night before, then it's really likely that I will modify my workout the next day Mm -hmm. because that plays hugely into it. So don't forget the variables outside of your workout that will play into your workout. Yeah. I never considered that either until a few years ago when I was like, oh man, I literally cannot do this workout. I always just kind of did what was supposed to happen that day and never thought much of it till it got to a point where I had no choice. I want to break in here to just talk a little bit about intuitive exercise. We've talked, and if you heard last week's episode with Steph, if not, please go back and listen to that. It was amazing. But we talked about intuitive eating, which essentially is stripping away the rules you have around food and using your body's own innate wisdom to tell you what it needs and wants. The same exact thing happens with your exercise and movement. If you've already worked to change your relationship with food and to be more intuitive, now you just take that same work you've done into your movement. And this works for someone who is already working out or hasn't started working out yet. Your body will tell you, yes, I want to move. No, I don't want to move. Yes, I want to lift heavy things. No, I don't want to lift heavy things. I need the day off. I need to go work out. It will tell you exactly what you should be doing. So that's why I'm going to say a million times today, listen to your body. If you are not tapped into your body right now and you're working out regularly, please get on it. Make that a priority. It will make all the difference in the world. The thing that will make that happen is when you approach your workouts and your movement because it is a vital part of being a healthy person, not because you want to be skinnier or fitter or change your body size. I've never seen someone work out intuitively that's main goal for that workout is to be smaller. I only see this intuitive exercise piece come into play when someone truly understands the power of movement and exercise and fitness to their overall health. So let's do that. Okay. Okay. All right. So hopefully that answers Grace's question. Let's move on. We have two complimentary questions here. One from Tiffany, how to know when to push on and work out versus when to rest and heal. And then also from Haley, how can you tell the difference between needing a break and mental resistance? Yeah, I love both of these questions. Super important. I think this is somewhat thing that all of us have been challenged with at some point in our lives is, okay, we don't want to work out right now. Is it because we just don't want to or because we actually truly need to rest. So here's the difference. Mental resistance is when you are talking yourself out of it. Like when you know you should be going to the gym, you know that's what your body would really do well with right now, but your ego has gotten in the way and started talking you out of what your intuition is telling you you need to do. And it's really obvious. Like it is very, very obvious. It's also obvious because when you need a break, when you actually physically need to rest, then you will feel physically fatigued. You'll feel tired, depleted, sore from your past workout. You will know your intuition will tell you hey, I need to like go take a nap or go on a leisurely stroll or go make dinner and relax with my family, your body will tell you that. So there are very different voices in the head. And also when you actually need a break, then you're going to 
feel it. It's going to physically come out to play. So that will be a good indicator. What I love about this question or these two questions is at the root of it, it really is getting to know more about yourself, right? Like getting to know yourself and being honest with yourself. But it's also an opportunity to be curious. So if you find yourself in this situation, like Haley is wanting to know, should I take a break or is it just me having some mental resistance? Like try to dive into that deeper and explore is, okay, if this is mental resistance, like why am I resisting wanting to work out right now? Do I feel tired? Is it maybe because I didn't eat enough today? Is it because I'm really stressed at work? I think, and this is just anecdotal, but I feel like mental resistance, there's always a, like a root cause to that. Mm -hmm. And for me, in my experience, one of the big causes for me was just, I didn't enjoy the type of workouts I was doing, right? I like felt like I had to go to the gym and I didn't really enjoy what I was doing. I was just doing it because I felt like I had to. And when I explored different modalities and different types of trainings, I finally fell into something that that I really truly look forward to doing and with a group of people I really love. And that is so motivating that I don't have that problem anymore of, you know, feeling any mental resistance. If it's fatigue, then I can tell, you know, if I don't want to know, it's really is truly because I'm tired. So I can tell you if you're having mental resistance because you're going to go on a treadmill or an elliptical for an hour, I don't blame you. Go outside instead and see how that feels. Another thing too, with mental resistance, This is what I always used to tell my clients is if you think it might be mental resistance, just go and try. Just go start on a walk, see if you want to run, see if you don't want to run, head to the gym, do some, you know, warm up activities, see if it feels good or if it doesn't. If not, leave. If it truly is because you need to rest, it won't feel good. And I had this experience. You, I think did too this week. And we are actually in the opposite category where our mental resistance would tell us to go work out even when we shouldn't. Like we have sometimes mental blinders on of, oh, I just want to move so badly that we can't tell when we do need to rest. So mine came where I was going out for a hike and didn't even make it a quarter of a mile up this mountain before I just had to turn around and walk back down because my muscles literally couldn't do it. It felt awful. It was not enjoyable. I was not enjoying the outdoors and the situation that I was in. It just hurt. It didn't feel good. And I knew then that I needed to rest. And again, I should have known that. I probably already did know that driving to the trailhead, but I kind of ignored it, just real life. And had to then go through the motions to be like, no, this wasn't right. So it happens to all of us. But if you, again, are really tapped in, if it feels awful, you need to rest. Yeah. No, that's a great, a great idea to kind of use as a barometer. And actually, I heard that tip and I, I can't remember which famous person suggested this, but to attribute it to them. But yeah, they called it like the 10 minute rule or something. And it's like, if you are not wanting to do something and the the example they gave was cleaning. It's like, if you really don't feel like cleaning, just do it, set a timer for 10 minutes and just clean for 10 minutes. And most of the time, once the 10 minutes is up, you still want to keep going because you're already into it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so I think the same goes in this situation. Maybe it's five minutes, maybe it's 10, but set your timer, move. If you still don't want to do it after the timer goes up, great. But a lot of us, I think, will find that we'll want to keep going. Yeah, you might as well. Yeah. Actually, we'll talk about this later. But, you know, we get an endorphin rush when we work out. So those 10 minutes, you're going to be like, man, I feel great. So you'll keep going, especially with workouts. All right, let's move on. Moving right along. All right. I'm not sure who submitted this, but it is how quickly do you need a post-workout snack? What are the best foods to eat before and after a workout? Yeah, so... Of course, there's always a lot of questions around how to eat for your workouts. And I totally understand. I totally get it. I used to be in that mode where I would time my workouts based on my food and my food based on my workouts. I don't really do that anymore, but I just want to give a little background as to why this is even something to consider. So when you have an intense workout, Now, remember that word I said, intense workout, you deplete your glycogen stores. So we store glycogen in our muscles. That's glucose stored in our muscles as glycogen. So that is fuel 
for your workouts when they are intense enough that glycogen turns to glucose and is used as fuel. So any carbohydrates that you were to eat after that workout will go straight towards replenishing those stores and or helping your muscle with the recovery from that workout you just had. So that's why there's always this kind of talk about what am I supposed to eat before and after a workout? Am I supposed to include carbs or not? Because we do want to have that glycogen storage fueled back up. Now it's a little bit different when you're keto because you don't necessarily need those carbohydrates to fuel your glycogen stores to refill them, I guess, the glycogen stores after your workout. And you use less glycogen during your workouts when you are fat fueled. However, there's still a lot of cases, myself included, where it just feels better to eat carbs and get that glycogen topped off after an intense workout. This is where we have to talk about that intensity because for most of you, you're probably not working out intensely enough for this to matter a super huge amount. If you are an athlete going to the Olympics, if you're a basketball player making millions of dollars every time you play a game, then it matters. And you probably have someone working with you on this. But for most of us, we're not working out to that capacity and to that intensity where this is something that you really, really, truly need to control. This is more so something where, again, we're seeing food as more than it is and trying to manipulate something else to be something different and to have some sort of effect that it doesn't really matter that much. So like for me, I think I work out fairly intensely and I just eat meals. I eat before a workout sometimes if I'm hungry. I eat my normal meal that I'm having after my workout afterwards at the normal time when I get hungry. Sometimes when I'm working out in the morning, I don't eat at all. I'm just not hungry to eat before that workout. Sometimes I am. Like same workout, same time of day, same everything. I'm just hungry sometimes and I'm not hungry other times. And so that's kind of what I've been doing the past few years. And it makes it a lot less confusing and a lot less stressful. And I still feel perfectly fueled. I'm still gaining muscle. I still feel strong. Yeah. Decision fatigue is a real thing. I think this is one area in life where I don't think it needs to become bigger than it is. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, and of course, I think everyone knows now I'm a fan of the N equals one. Everybody's different. You just need to experiment with, with yourself. There really is no right or wrong answer for each person to this question. It's kind of depends on you and everybody's different and no day for each person is the same. Yeah. Because no workout is the same. Right. So you just got to kind of try some stuff. See how you feel. Yeah. I would say in general, If you feel like you do better with carbohydrates in your workouts, that's what I found. I was keto for a long time. I wasn't really having very many carbohydrates. And then I started to and I felt so much better in my workouts. And so that was a cue for me that my body does better when I have carbs in those moderately intense to intense workouts. So I started adding them in and it wasn't like, within 30 minutes of completing this workout, I need to have X number of carbohydrates. It was just like sometime that day before the next workout, I was going to eat carbohydrates. And that worked really well, still does work really well. But you might be keto and your performance is great, not having carbohydrates at all or not timing those out. And that's cool too. It's totally dependent. Maybe you feel better with more protein after. Totally. Yeah. The one thing I would say that applies to everybody that we don't talk about often is hydration. We Mm -hmm. talk about what to eat, but going into a workout dehydrated or not rehydrating after a really intense workout is no bueno you will feel the equivalent, if not worse, to not eating properly. True. You will feel totally depleted. Yeah. Your joints hurt, feel kind of sticky. You know, hydration is so important going into your workouts. So we talk about this all the time, but just as a reminder, (laughs) half your body weight in ounces of water, filtered water every day is the starting point. If you work out and you sweat, drink more. If you drink coffee, if you drink caffeinated tea, sodas, whatever, drink more. And y'all don't go and drink guzzle 
like a huge thing right before you go to the gym. Ooh, that all, is- that, all you're asking for is to have to stop to go pee every 20 minutes through your workout. And Does- just have it sloshing around in yeah. your stomach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sip. Be a sipper. Be a sipper throughout the day. A mindful sipper. And if you do want to include carbohydrates, again, you know we're going to say this, healthy, nutrient-dense, real food carbohydrates, sweet potatoes, white potatoes, white rice, if those are things you tolerate, fruit, plantains, things you can find in nature. Don't go for the gummy bears or those gel thing, pack (laughs) things. (laughs) That is like not good. Do you ever eat those like any kind of bar? Like, oh, bars. (laughs) all the time remember i was in the fitness industry for 11 years That's oh, what you, they i'm promote. sure you got a discount oh i discount? did of course <laughs> of course oh yeah the chalkier the better mm. gross let me take just a moment in this episode to highlight another brand that is doing it right you probably all know about my love affair with primally pure at this point i've talked about them on the show before many times but i just want to give them a shout out once again Over the past 100 episodes, we've talked about toxicity as a contributor to health issues so much and the importance of detoxifying every facet of your life. Skincare, of course, is one of the biggest areas to consider because our skin is our most absorbent and biggest organ. The good news is that it's also super easy to make the change thanks to Primally Pure. Primally Pure is an all-natural skincare company that uses only certified organic ingredients that can actually be found in nature. No harsh chemicals or additives. It's truly safe skincare. Their product line ranges from deodorant to body butters, cleansing oils to bath soaks, and even a baby line. I'm happy to say I've tried them all, literally every single one, except for the baby line, obviously. And they all work fabulously and smell even better. If you've been on the hunt for a natural deodorant, and if you haven't, you should be, this is the last stop on your hunt, I promise. I was on a hunt for a long time. I found Primally Pure. I've been using it every single day for the past six years because it is the only one that actually works. There's lots of different flavors. I prefer alternating between the blue tansy and the charcoal. The charcoal is great for workouts. It's really strong. So I put that on before my workouts. And then the blue tansy just smells like girl. So when I want to smell pretty, I swipe on the blue tansy. This is also the place to go to switch to the oil cleansing method for your face, which you may or may not have heard about. If you haven't, they have a great blog post about it. You can check out. Oil cleansing is yet another thing I switched to years ago and so happy that I have Primally Pure to support me with that. My skin loves their cleansing oils and my tan skin really loves their body butters, which is what I used when I got back from Hawaii. Wanted to keep my Hawaiian tan as long as possible throughout the winter and I put on body butter every single night, put on my robe, let it sink in and it really actually helped. Support this female-owned and operated business and this episode of the podcast by heading to seanminer.com slash primallypure and use the code KETO, the number four women, for 10% off your order. Again, that's seanminer.com slash primallypure and use KETO for women for 10% off your order. All right. All right, Pamela. Should perimenopausal women work out differently than when they were younger? Ooh, I love this question because that would imply then that as we age, we shouldn't be pushing ourselves as hard. We should expect to lose strength, lose stamina, lose endurance. And of course, that's not the case depending on where you're coming from. But what I really want to get across here for anybody who is worried about aging and working out is please don't go into it thinking that you need to modify your workouts just because of your age. As I've said, I've trained mainly people over the age of 50, 60, 70, 80, and they were doing the same things as the people that I was training that were 20, 30, 40. They can and will 
do the same thing as long as you don't put that cap on it for yourself, that like kind of mental block that you have against trying to get stronger and trying to get more fitness into your day just because of the age you are now compared to what you were used to doing when you were 20 or 30. Now, it might be different. It might end up being different, but you just have to try it and find out. You know, don't limit yourself to only picking up the five pound weights. Try the 10 pound weights, try the 20 pound weights. Keep going up until you feel like, no, this is too much. And it also may take a little bit longer to, I guess, graduate, especially if you're kind of starting fresh. Maybe you used to work out in your 20s and 30s, kind of fell off the wagon, and now you're coming back to it 10, 20 years later. It may take a little longer for you to build up to where you were or even close to where you were, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. That doesn't mean that it isn't right for you and shouldn't be happening. Just give yourself the patience and the time and keep pushing yourself. There is no reason not to push yourself. There's nothing about perimenopause. There's nothing about menopause that would keep you from trying to push yourself. It just may feel different. Yes, you may be a little bit weaker. Yes, it may take a little longer for all of this to happen. And you may never get to where you were, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Okay, because I don't know a whole lot in this space. So maybe you know, Sean, but would you say that peri or postmenopausal women have a heightened susceptibility to maybe like the repercussions of overtraining? Yeah, definitely could be because of even just where their adrenals are at at that time of their life, especially kind of as we age and we don't take care of our adrenals over the years, then yeah, we have a lower sensitivity to stress. So it may take longer. You may need two or three days in between your workouts before you feel ready to do that type of workout again. And If you are overtraining, just the same way as someone who is cycling, if you're overtraining, then yes, it could have some impact on your hormones, just the same way it does for all of us. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. So yeah, you still need to pay attention to that. It may have more of an impact, perhaps. But again, if we're using our own awareness and our own instincts, then you're going to be fine. It does not mean, though, that you need to like baby yourself. Yeah. Well, age is a real thing. And I think, you know, with age comes just more injuries Mm -hmm. that have been sustained over time, which is real. And you have to work with that as you get older and need to move and have limitations. But I think that transition us well into Margaret's question is, what are some suggestions for older women and or those with a history of injuries from working out? Yeah. So again, it's a spot where you could let your mind start limiting you because the reason why you have these injuries is how you worked out in the past. So now you're kind of scared of working out even to the remote capacity that you once had. And that's understandable. But again, we're at this place where we do not want to let our mindset or our fear around those workouts, those movements get in the way of what we could actually be doing for our body. Because it's quite common knowledge, I think at this point, and if you don't know, now you know, that movement is really good and actually essential to heal those injuries. And time and time again, I would have people coming in to see me as a client and they would be like, well, I have this shoulder injury. I've had it for five years. So I just don't do anything on this shoulder. It's like, well, that is just making it that much worse. You have to move that spot where the injury is in a safe approach, of course, in a safe movement pattern in order to heal and to promote that continued healing and health and to get your body back to this place where you feel good and mobile. So don't baby that portion of your body or really your whole body just because you've had an injury there. Move the body. A little bit of discomfort is actually okay, especially if you're in this place where you're trying to get more mobility back into that spot. A little bit of discomfort is okay. Pain, of course, is not. And there's a very big difference. So be on the lookout for that. 
of course, work with someone who can guide you in all of this so that you're making sure to get into movement from a safe place and with the right approach. But be open minded. Don't be scared. Be open minded. Yeah, I think the caveat truly is trying to find somebody to help support your goals. So if you've sustained injuries in the past, or even just have nagging aches and pains, and there's really no acute reason for them, but they are maybe limiting your your movements, or you've actually developed new problems because of them, it's super important to work with somebody who can help uncover the root cause. Because, you know, you could be experiencing knee pain because your calf is tight or shoulder pain because of a glute problem. It is so crazy how interconnected the body is. And, you know, it might not be as simple as, well, I just need to stretch this out and then it'll feel better. There might be a whole cascade of things that need to be addressed. But, don't lose hope and keep trying different things. There's a lot of modalities out there, you know, physical therapy, massage, all sorts of things, acupuncture even. So if one thing doesn't help or it gets you so far, but you still have more to go, keep trying if you can and you're able, keep trying with other practitioners and yeah, finding your place. Help is always a really good idea when it comes to movement. And just to make sure you don't you prevent injury, you don't do true, more harm, true. future harm. I mean, a 20 year old would benefit from having someone help with their movement patterns just as much as a 50 year old or 80 year old. Yeah. Well, even people with amazing body awareness, you really don't know. Even if you're looking in a mirror, you cannot spot all the places where maybe you're shifting a little bit mm-hmm. or you're compensating somewhere. And human beings are amazing at compensating. But that's where we run into problems eventually down the, the road. Our bodies want to keep us safe. Yeah. So those dysfunctional movement patterns are real. And if we keep moving in a, in a dysfunctional way, you'll just keep adding more and more problems to your list. The entire time I was a personal trainer, I had a personal trainer for myself. So that just goes to show that even if you think you know what you're doing, you still need another set of eyes most of the time. All right, moving right along. All right, Mary, what are the best things to do for posture? I love this question (laughs) because so good. Who doesn't need help with their posture? Seriously. So let's do a little exercise. Everybody right now, I want you to I am doing it myself, get into good posture. So that would mean your shoulders, like what I always say is feel like you're tucking your shoulder blades into your back pockets. So your shoulders come up, down and back. Like my pant pockets? Your pant pockets, your fake pant pockets if you're wearing yoga pants. So tuck them into your back pockets, right? So your shoulders come back. Now I want you to feel like what muscles are working in order to make that happen. So you can feel, hopefully, if you're remotely in tune with your body, if not, this is a good exercise for that, your back muscles engage. So all those muscles in your back engage. You also probably noticed that when you started doing this exercise, if you were seated, you stood up really like nice and tall, you got this really long spine and you automatically engaged your core so that those muscles in your lower back, basically your whole trunk is considered your core. But we know it most as like the, our ab muscles, we'll consider them our ab muscles and you know, the muscles in our lower back. So all of that becomes engaged. So then you would be able to know the muscles that need to be strengthened in order to naturally have better posture. The stronger you get your back muscles and the stronger you get your core, then the easier it will be for you to maintain good posture without you even trying, without you even noticing. So you work on building up strength in your back, in your lower back, your upper back, also in your core, while then also gaining mobility or stretching out your shoulders and your chest. Because again, if we go back to sitting in poor posture like we just were two minutes ago, then you can see you start hunching over and you kind of have this shortening effect that happens in your chest, your chest muscles, your pectorals, and your shoulders, they come forward. So we have to kind of work on building up the mobility there while building strength in the back of our body to naturally bring us up. So you're doing that in the gym. Those are things that you could actively be working on in the gym. But then also, you kind of have to think about it. You have to think about being in good posture all the time for a while. And it is 
almost impossible. I am not good at it either because, you know, we sit in front of our computers, in front of the TV, in front of our food, and we just slouch. But just as much as you can, even if you're just standing in line at the grocery store, you're sitting at your desk, you're walking into the mall, whatever it is, think about what your body is doing and how it is positioned and that you have those shoulders, your shoulder blades tucked into your back pockets and your pelvis is underneath your shoulders. So your hip bones, you want to be right in alignment underneath your shoulders. You could even set a reminder on your phone, like every yeah, hour or something, a, a little reminder pops up. Especially if you're someone that works in front of a computer at a desk all day, yeah. even like every 20 minutes. I mean, I say every 20 minutes, you should be getting up and doing something. So that could be part of it. You know what's going to happen now? What? Well, our phones are sitting right here, so they're listening to us. So now we're going to get... Oh my gosh, We're going to so get true. tons of ads on Instagram for those little posture things you stick on your back, those little buttons. And it that like zaps Bluetooth. you. Yeah, it like buzzes every 20 minutes or something. You get an electric shock yeah. when you Just don't have wait. good posture. You screenshot that and put it on your Instagram and when you get an ad for it. I will. You guys will all know. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's going to happen, I guarantee you. All right. Next uh, one. Next one. Do you strength train on a set schedule or intuitively? Love this question too. The gym that I work out at has a set schedule for their strength classes. So yes, I have to be on some sort of schedule in order to work out with those classes. But I would say how I work out in those classes changes, again, based on how I feel that day, how I slept, how much stress I'm under, just how I feel, how I ate, all those things come into play. And if I don't feel 100%, then I don't do up to my full capacity in that workout. So that's how I kind of use my intuition on a set schedule. I feel the ability and the freeness to change my workouts based on how I feel, even though I'm in some sort of structure. But when I was sick and I was dealing with major adrenal burnout, I would be 100% intuitive with all of my workouts. I would go strictly based on how I was feeling because I was at a point where it was like some days I had to go back to bed after I ate breakfast and other days I felt like decent and I could go do a workout. I could do a workout at home and I would just do as much as my body allowed. Sometimes it was 10 minutes, sometimes it was 40 minutes, but that part of my life is where I really learned what intuition meant because I didn't have any other choice. I had to fully be in tune with my body in order to work out well, not hurt myself any further, either physically or adrenal, you know, with my adrenals. So that was how I was able to do that. But now that I am well and healthy and strong and have gotten to this place, it's not so much about that because I always feel good enough to do some sort of workout. I feel I'm very like grateful for that because I've been in a place where that wasn't the case. It just kind of varies based on how much I'm going to push myself that day. Yeah. And I think you're the same. It's like a both and. Exactly. Not an either or. Right. Well, there are benefits to scheduling, but it kind of depends on where you're, where you feel challenged. Like if you're, tendency is to overtrain, then maybe doing the more intuitive thing is going to be better for you in the long run. And if you maybe have some issues with accountability or staying, you know, strict with it, then scheduling can be great because then it's on the calendar and you can always decide to change at the last minute. But I feel like putting it on the calendar gives it importance, mm -hmm. helps you prioritize it. Yeah. If you're someone that struggles with working out and making that a priority and getting into the habit of it, being on a schedule with a class or something helps so much. You don't have to think about it at all. It's not a like, oh, I'm going to go to the gym. What am I going to do today? Oh, I just won't go at all. It's You don't have to worry about it. It's yeah. there. It's on your schedule. You just go and you enjoy it. So I do really recommend that for people that are just starting out with working out. Yeah. It's back to that whole decision fatigue thing. If you can eliminate that in any areas of your life, you're good. So if you put it on the schedule, it's not even a question. You're going to the gym or you're doing this thing, going to this class, that'll help you out. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Ready? Yep. All right. Amy asks, workouts and autoimmune disease, specifically MS. And Christine also asks, where do you suggest someone start if they have inflammation and fibromyalgia? Well, the first place to start is again in your head and realizing that you can 
actually move your body and it will be good for you. So it's the first point of getting over that fear that moving your body is going to make things worse. It's going to cause more pain. It's going to cause more inflammation when actually the opposite will happen. So you get over it and then give it a shot. Take it, of course, super easy. Be gentle with yourself. This is another great time to hire a professional and see how it goes. Start slow, start easy. My favorite place to start is just using body weight movements and even supported body weight movements. Like if, for example, you could do squats and you could hold on to the back of a chair. So you're holding on to the back, you're supported and you're squatting, of course, go onto YouTube and look for a proper squat form first. So you're not injuring your knees or anything. You could squat into the chair. So you're just getting up and down off of a chair. That's a workout too. You could step up and down onto stairs. And that would be a great workout for your legs. Just up, up, down, down, holding onto the railing if you need extra support. We've talked about bands before. Bands are great for anyone, but definitely for people that are just getting started and people that need to be gentle to themselves, love bands. I also love suspension straps, which are like the TRX straps. If you've ever seen those yellow and black things at the gym, if you go to that, that's what I'm talking about. They do make a kind that I used when I was going to people's homes to train where you can just hook them on the door and shut the door and they stay in place. They're so great. I'll link to those in the show notes here so you can take a peek. But Those I used more for my like 80 year olds than I did for like my 20 and 30 year olds. I use them both, obviously, but you can have such great strength workouts and really supported strength workouts with those suspension straps. So I highly recommend those. And I haven't mentioned, I think I've mentioned it before on the show, but I do, I created a whole workout, whole 28 day program for people that have adrenal burnout, that have autoimmune disease, inflammation, are just starting out with their workouts, only want to work out at home. I have that on my website. It's an oldie, but a goodie. It's an oldie, but a goodie. I created it when I was still a trainer. So that tells you how old it is. But I go through it all the time and it still totally makes sense. It still is exactly what I would do for someone like Amy or Christine or someone that's just starting out with a workout and they're great workouts at home. It's what I did. Well, even, I mean, if you're just starting out, the simplest of things like taking the stairs, Mm -hmm. opting to walk more or, you know, doing things, just being mindful of opportunities where you can move instead of ride or sit, standing a little more when you work. Those are great places to start. Yep. And those are just integrated into everyday life. Totally. So So. easy. And we all should be doing that. Any and all of us should be doing those things. It's really easy to get more movement because that's the thing you did mention at the beginning. There's a difference between fitness and healthy movement. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're talking about fitness today. We talked about it a lot, but that doesn't mean that healthy movement isn't just as important. And the difference really is, I think movement is more the simple things that you do every day. So we are all in this society in this 2019 world where we just sit a lot. We stare at our phones, we stare at our computers, we sit and we are super inactive. So even just taking breaks and standing throughout the day, walking around, taking a walk around your building or on the block, standing when you're working, getting a standing desk, taking a walk when you get home, like with your family or something, or just going outside and playing with your family. These simple things are movement that is beyond your fitness routine. We all should be doing both, but that's how they are separate and both super duper important. Mm -hmm. I think I got off track, but that's just... A little segue into the small tangent, an important, an important tangent. But back to Amy and Christine, don't be afraid to move. Be cautiously optimistic. Do what you can. Start small, but you will make gains more quickly than you think. It will feel better than you think, and it does reduce inflammation working out. So look at that. Inflammation is a detox. It's so many great things. Get your sweat on. It's so many things. It's amazing. All right. We have time for one more. Okay. Let's get to Holly. She asked thoughts on carb intake prior to working out fasted hit workouts in the early AM. Would it cause adrenal stress to remain fasted? To the point of adrenal stress, as long as you are adequately fueled, 
then no, it won't harm you to go train early in the morning fasted, especially if you wake up and you're not hungry. If you wake up and you're hungry and you ignore that and you go try to have this intense workout anyway, yeah, it's probably not the greatest. But what do you mean by adequately fueled? From like the previous night? Great question. Well, just in general, in Ah. general life, I mean, no matter what workouts you're doing, and this is actually something that didn't come up in these questions, but of course I want to talk about, if you want to see results with your workouts, and if you want to change your body composition, get stronger, get faster, whatever your goal is and why you're working out, you have got to eat to fuel those workouts. Even if you're keto, you need nutrients to fuel that workout, not just relying on this fat fueling approach. You have to adequately fuel yourself. So that means intaking as many nutrients as you have depleted over the day. So keep that in mind and make sure you are eating. Eat for fuel. So then you know, to Holly's question, if you had this great dinner, your whole day, the day before was really awesome, had all these nutrient dense vegetables, and maybe some carbohydrates, some really awesome sources of protein, and then you wake up and you're not really hungry, and you want to go to your hit class then go, you're fine, no big deal. But if you wake up and you're starving, you're like, shoot, what do I do? Well, maybe taking a few bites of food would be helpful and would keep your body kind of in that non-stressed out zone. And if you're wondering if that should be carbohydrates, the only way to know is to test it. I think that is a completely appropriate time to test for yourself and see how you do. What I would recommend is, you know, if you're already going fasted, you kind of have a good idea of how you feel in those workouts. Spend a few days or, you know, a few times of that type of workout having even just like a few bites of banana or something like that, something really easy, super simple, easy to digest first thing in the morning. You can just take a few bites and go and see if you notice that your workouts improve. Yeah, right. I was thinking the same thing too, because you may think, well, I'm not hungry when I get up and I go and I crush that workout, but maybe it'd be even better with a few bites of banana. Exactly. Like that's how I was. I thought my workouts were great. And then I started eating carbohydrates and working out. And I was like, Oh, (laughs) they weren't that great. Actually, they could have been way better. So that might be the case for you, but it might not. And either way is is fine. And that's really just kind of your way of determining what your body does best with and how it handles these types of workouts. So either way is not going to cause any adrenal stress, again, as long as you are properly fueled. If you want to completely stress out your body, don't eat enough food and go work out. Do a hit style. No, oh, yikes. Which I love. Good, they're great, but you got to have that fuel. All right, I think we'll cut it here. Those are great questions. Really good. Thanks, everybody. You guys are always so smart. So smart and such insightful questions. I love it. Really makes us think. Always impressed. Keeps us on our toes. Heck yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. And we will be back next week. Until then, take care. <laughs>